So uh, my sister and I had a complicated relationship uh, growing up. Part, part of the reason for that is we were so close in age, like we were only like 15 months apart, and that just adds some complexities to a sibling relationship that if you're spread out maybe isn't, isn't quite as bad. Um, so like for example, we, we just were around each other a lot at school activities and stuff. Uh, we had some of the same friends, so all the drama kind of got mixed up in that. Or like she'd have a crush on one of my friends, or I'd have a crush on one of her friends, and things just kind of got mixed up that way. So that was one of the reasons. One of the other reasons is because uh, we lived out in the middle of nowhere. I mean, I, I said a lot of stuff about the country earlier, but I really did grow up in a, in a really small town. I graduated from a small high school, but when I was in elementary school, even before that, for about five or six years, I lived 13 miles from a town of about 300 that was named Bland. So that kind of summed up the town, right? And we were 13 miles from that. It was so bad, like, we had to go to town to get water. I'm not making that, like, we, our well wasn't very good, so we had to go get water and stuff. Like, it was just really remote. But since we lived out in the middle of nowhere, that made my sister and I playmates, right? Like, we had animals on the farm, and we had each other. So if it was human interaction we were looking for, there was one choice. And that was fine most of the time, but there were these other times that got super, super frustrating. Because all I wanted to do growing up was play baseball. That's all I wanted to do. And so I would go out in the yard by myself, I'd have my bat, I'd have my ball, and I'd stand there, and I'd do all the daydreaming things, and set up the situation, and be the hero of every game, and all that kind of stuff. But my sister hated sports. So it was like pulling teeth to try to get her to play baseball with me. So finally, we came up with this plan, which I thought was fair. It sounded like a good plan to me. And that was, she said if I would play dolls with her for 30 minutes, then she would come out and play baseball with me for 30 minutes. So that sounded like a decent deal. And I had recently received a Cabbage Patch Kid doll the previous Christmas. So it was like, okay, we can do this. So we would play dolls or whatever. Blah, blah, blah. And uh, my, my Cabbage Patch guy, his name was Justin. And she had a Cabbage Patch girl named Diana. But then she got a non-Cabbage Patch doll that had like purple hair. And her name was Darcy. And she just came in and messed everything up for Diana and Justin. It was very dramatic. But I digress. Oh, also one time for reasons that I don't recall, because I was like seven, Diana's head, head fell off. So that was a whole different plot line uh, as well. Um, yeah, Darcy. Ugh. Yeah. So anyway, uh, so I would play dolls with her for 30 minutes. And then it would be time, like, yes, it's time to, I've paid my dues, it's time to go outside and play some baseball. And this is where my sister would just sort of mysteriously contract some illness or affirmity every single time. Like, oh, I can't go outside, I've got a bellyache, or oh, I've got a really bad headache, or I'm allergic to outside, or whatever. And it made me so mad, right? Because I had, I had done my part of the deal, and she wasn't willing to do her part. Which leads us to the other complex part of our relationship, which is when we would fight. And I don't mean like, nee, 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 fight. I mean like, <laughs> fight. Now here's the problem. We had this rule in my house. And it was a very straightforward rule. And it was a rule that was not to be broken. And that rule was, Titus, you are not allowed to hit girls. And I'm like, she's not a girl. She's my sister. Like, let's go. And the other thing that made me so mad, and I still have scars on my arms from my sister because she would take her fingernails and dig them into my flesh to where I bled and there was literally nothing I could do about it until I realized a loophole in the plan. I wasn't allowed to hit my sister. So what I did was... I would often take a blanket and I would put it over her face. <laughs> and, 
And then I would grab her by the wrists and I would make her hit herself. <laughs> right? Yeah, it was brilliant. Brilliant. Now, here's the problem. Here's the problem. Because you all, that, especially those of you that have siblings, are like, yeah, get it, man. But, yeah. but here's the thing. Was I clever as an eight-year-old or whatever to find that loophole? Sure. Points for me. But it was still wrong to hit my sister. And any time I did it, there were these three words that she could unleash that would not only get me to stop hitting her or cause her to hit herself, but they would also just sort of rise in me this feeling of being trapped and stuck and busted. Not only in that instant when she uttered those three words, but for moments or even hours following when the reckoning came, because the three words she would say were, I'm gonna tell. And I want to tell you something tonight. When I heard those three words, I felt on the inside exactly like I feel right now with these shackles around my wrist. When my sister would say those words, I'm going to tell, I would feel exactly like Caleb was talking about this morning when he was sharing how we carry these chains with us in our lives and they weigh us down and they can get pretty crushing, right? They can really kind of mess us up if we're not careful. And so this relationship with my sister and those words that she would say taught me something. They taught me that our rebellion will always tell on us. And what our rebellion often does is it makes us a liar. So this one time I got in a three-wheeler accident. I don't know, I was probably 10 or 11, something like that. I was over at my buddy Justin Bradshaw's house. Justin lived even further out in the country than I did. He was a total redneck, like it was awesome. And he had this three-wheeler that his family had kind of built or something. I don't know, but it was really cool. And he's like, hey, you want to go for a three-wheeler ride? And I was like, sure, let's do it. So we rode around on the three-wheeler for a little bit. I think he was a year older than me, so he knew what he was doing. And then we'd ridden around for a little while, and he's like, hey, man, you want to drive? And I was like, duh. So I started driving this three-wheeler. Uh, one of the problems was that I'd never driven a three-wheeler before. Another one of the problems is we were on this path out in the woods that was, had ruts in the dirt, and it was really kind of treacherous, and I was getting pretty nervous, and we were going too fast, and I hit this rut just so, and it kind of kicked the front wheel off to the side, and I wasn't strong enough to grab the handlebars and pull us back, and I looked up, and we were headed straight for a tree, and I just kind of froze. I wasn't sure what to do, and I'm sure we weren't going as fast as I felt like we were going, but I just felt like I had no time to respond, very little time to press down on the brakes, and we slammed into that tree, and the handlebar kicked back, and it hit me right in the chin. And we got off the three-wheeler, and we kind of checked on each other, are you okay, are you okay, yeah, I think I'm okay. He's like, dude, your, your chin's bleeding. And I felt my chin and I could see the blood. So we went back to the house and I cleaned it all up and I sort of assessed the damages of, uh, of our accident. And I realized that I was in big trouble because the truth is I wasn't even supposed to be on the three-wheeler. Like my parents knew that Justin had a three-wheeler. They knew he had one. And they had expressly told me not to get on the three-wheeler. And I thought I would be okay taking that little joyride that they would never find out. But what I didn't know is what I just told you, which is that our rebellion always tells on us. And it binds us. And it weighs us down. And so what was I supposed to do? I realized 
that I had to hide this cut on my chin. So my parents came to pick me up, and I was like, oh, nice to see you. Yes, let's go home. And I got in the car, and I just kind of, you know, I'm um, sleeping over here, and tr tried to hide it. I remember when I got home, I went outside, and I played the entire rest of the day and stayed away from my parents because I didn't want them to see it. When I went in to eat, I sat with one hand on my chin while I ate, just hoping they wouldn't see. Because what I didn't know is that our rebellion always tells on us, and it makes us into a liar, and it makes us cover up, and it makes us stay away from people that care about us because they, we don't want them to see our rebellion. They don't, we don't want them to see our scars. There are things that we will hide because we know that we're bound. We know that we're stuck. We know that we're trapped. Your rebellion is always going to tell on you. And it leaves us bound and it leaves us weighed down. It leaves us in these shackles. So we've been talking about 1 John. I want you to turn if you can or just listen to 1 John chapter 2. I want to read verses 1 through 6. Because what John says here, guys, it's, it's right in line with what we're talking about. John starts, My dear children, I write this to you so that you will not sin. But if anybody does sin, we have an advocate with the Father. Jesus Christ, the righteous one. He is the atoning sacrifice for our sins. And not only for ours, but also for the sins of the whole world. We know that we have come to know him if we keep his commands. Get this. Whoever says, I know him, but does not do what he commands is a liar. And the truth is not in that person. But if anybody obeys his word, love for God is truly made complete in them. This is how we know we are in him. Whoever claims to live in him must live as Jesus did. Now there's a couple things about this text that I find really interesting and I think are worth mentioning. The first one is this use of this phrase, dear children. John uses that more than anyone. This little bitty kind of short letter that he writes in 1 John, he uses dear children or children uh, more often than any New Testament letter, even the really long ones. And what we learn from that is his tone of voice is really tender right here. And I want you to know that the rest of what I have to say to you tonight is not like a lecture from one of your teachers or a scolding from one of your coaches or punishment from one of your parents. This is with the same tone and the same motivation that I think John originally writes these words. You are dear to me. You are dear to God. The people to whom John was writing, they were dear to him. The other thing that I think is so interesting about this text is he says, I write this at the very beginning. My dear children, I write this to you. Well, what does he write to them? Like, it's not what he's about to say that he's referencing there. It's what he just got done saying. And so I think we would do well to go back and look at that briefly. 1 John chapter 1, starting in verse 5. This is the message we have heard from him and declare to you. God is light. In him there is no darkness at all. If we claim to have fellowship with him and yet walk in the darkness, we lie. There's that again. And do not live out the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus. His Son, it purifies us from all sin. If we claim to be without sin, if we claim to be without chains, if we claim to be without these shackles, then we deceive ourselves. And the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just. He'll forgive us of our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. If we claim we have not sinned, we make him out to be a liar, and his word is not in us. Here's what John is really saying at the end of chapter 1, at the beginning of chapter 2, both of which we just read. Your rebellion, your disobedience, your darkness, your chains, your shackles, they're always going to tell on you. If you claim you don't have these, you're lying. 
We all have these. We all have these shackles. And when I look at this text, that's the first thing that sticks out to me is just our rebellion gives us away. It, it, it tells on us. It's like my sister. I'm going to tell. Anytime we step out of the light and we allow darkness into our life, our rebellion whines at us. I'm going to tell. It's what the scripture says. Your sin is always going to find you out. But sometimes our shackles aren't just sin. Sometimes they're deep worry and anxiety. Maybe about something totally outside of your control. Man, there's so many people today that are just living in fear about how they're going to be perceived, about what their future may hold. And we get so anxious and worried and that binds us but so often we put ourselves in this situation through our own disobedience and our own rebellion and here students is what you need to understand you can come to conferences like this and you can learn all the words to the songs and you can do all the little things and you can buy the t-shirt and all that kind of stuff you can say whatever you want but it is whether or not you are obeying Jesus that reveals who you are. It just reveals who you are. We can say whatever we want. Talk is cheap. We can say, I'm in the light. I'm in the light. I belong to Jesus. I belong to Jesus. But John says it more than once in those scriptures that we read. 1 John chapter 2, verse 4. Whoever says, I know him, speaking of Jesus, but does not do what he commands is a liar and the truth is not in that person you can say whatever you want you can claim whatever you want you can project an image however you want but if you are not walking with jesus obeying jesus following his commands then you're a liar when you say that stuff John says it, the truth is not in you. You know, we've got these shackles on our wrists, but I think sometimes a, a more accurate depiction of this would be like, man, could we, could we throw a blanket over this, or could we hide these behind our back? And we're like, no, I'm good, yeah, oh man, stuff's good, yeah, Je yeah, I love Jesus. And people are like, well, what's the chain? It's like, no, <laughs> Jesus is good, yeah, I love Jesus. And we wish we could hide this stuff. But I think it's time we're honest with ourselves. That our rebellion is telling on us. And we can feel these things tightening around our wrists. And we can feel the burden of the chain again and again. So listen, when I read 1 John, I get it. Like, our rebellion tells on us. But the good news is, our advocate covers for us. So we try all these twisted ways to hide, and it's like, no, I wasn't on a three-wheeler. We try all these ways to conceal our chains and our shackles. We're trying to cover for ourselves. We come up with all these excuses. We make ourselves out to be a liar with no truth in us whatsoever. And Jesus is standing there going, I'll cover for you. John says that, right? If anyone claims he doesn't sin, he's lying. But if we confess our sin, Jesus is faithful. He'll forgive us of our sin. He'll cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we live in darkness, then we're going to stay in our shackles. But Jesus, our advocate, the beauty of the gospel is that even as our rebellion seeks to tell on us and have us be found out, Jesus will advocate for you. He never did anything wrong. Jesus was this perfect piece of humanity that, that lived in the truth and lived in tension and pointed towards beauty and relationship and connection and joy and fulfillment 
And even though he lived in such a perfect manner, and even though we live in such an imperfect manner, he was willing to take the burden of our sin on himself. He, he was the perfect sacrifice. He allowed himself to be weighed down so that we didn't have to be. He allowed himself to take on the burden of our sin so that our burden of sin could be removed. The, the beauty of the gospel is that Jesus, perfect, spotless, he pleads our case. He rose to life. He sits at the right hand of the Father. And the other thing that he does that I think is so remarkable in this text is that he illuminates our life. 1 John chapter 1, verses 6 and 7. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. I'm not in, I'm not in bondage. I don't have chains. You're deceiving yourself. But if we confess our sin... If we, I'm sorry, verse 7. If we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sin. If we claim to have fellowship with Jesus, but we walk in the darkness, we're deceiving ourselves. But if we'll walk in the light as Jesus is in the light and let him illuminate our lives, we can receive freedom. We can have our burdens lifted. We can have our chains broken because he advocates for us. And we can have this burden that we carry removed because he is the one that illuminates our life and invites us. Now, don't do anything with your chains yet. We'll get there. I want to make sure you understand before we invite you into anything. I need you to understand that there's this important moment when our chains fall off, when our shackles are snapped, and that moment is when you step into the light. If you continue to live in darkness, if you continue to live in rebellion, you're going to remain in chains. It's when we step into the light, because that's where Jesus is, that he illuminates our lives and we can begin to feel the freedom that our advocate has to offer. So maybe you have felt that weight and you have been bound by sin and rebellion all your life. You're here this week and like this is the closest to Jesus you've ever been. Like this whole thing is new to you. And you're going, wait, what's he talking about? Like I can be free from all that. Maybe you've felt that all your life. And you're like, I don't know if that dude's telling you, me the truth. Can I just challenge you? Don't try to hide your chains anymore. Don't try to pretend like everything's all good. And don't try to break your chains yourself when we do that in our lives, when we do that with our souls, when we try to free ourselves, we usually get more bound up. Instead, if you have felt that weight all your life, would you just step into the light? of Jesus. Maybe for some of you, like you've grown up in the church and you've decided to follow Jesus, but you know that you have reached down and voluntarily put the, the weight of sin and rebellion and darkness back on yourself. And you're sitting here and you're going, man, I used to feel free, but I feel all burdened again. I feel all shackled again. This feeling that I have on my wrist right now, I feel that in my heart as well. If you would just step into the light and let Jesus take that burden from you, step into the light again. If you're tired of the bondage and of the chains, of living in darkness, of feeling the pressure of your own rebellion, knowing that your rebellion always tells on you. Tonight, I want to invite you to step into the light. Our rebellion tells on us, but our advocate covers for us again and again and again when we willingly step into the light. 
So I was driving through Or City, Texas, which is a dot on the map north of Longview, kind of up in the northeast corner of Texas. We were coming back from Missouri, where we had recently moved from about a year before, traveling late at night. My kids were small. They were sacked out in the back. My wife was asleep in the passenger seat. I don't know. It must have been 12 or 1 o'clock. And I was cruising through this little town, and I know I was going a little too fast. Nothing crazy, but I was going a little too fast. And I also knew that I had a taillight out. I discovered it along the way. There was nothing I could do, really, to fix it on the trip. But I had a taillight out. And as I pulled into Or City and kind of slowed down and started going through the town, I saw the lights behind me. There was a police car pulling me over, and I thought, oh, great, you know. So I pull over to the side of the road, and this big-bellied country sheriff, I mean, he's straight out of the movies, like he just waddles up to my car, and he asks for my license and registration. Well, this is where things really get hairy. If you're keeping track, I'm speeding, I've got a taillight out, and he asks for my license and registration. And what I had not done yet, even though I lived in Texas now for probably close to a year, is I had not updated my license. I still had Missouri plates on the car, and my license was still a Missouri license plate, and that's also against the law. So we're speeding, we've got a taillight out, and I've got expired uh, plates and uh, license. And so this guy, I mean, he, he gets me good, and he's like, how long have you lived in Texas? And I thought, like, when I get in those situations, I always think I'm going to be charming. <laughs> and so I, th I thought I was being funny. And I was like, well, long enough to know better. <laughs> and he's just like nothing. He's not impressed. My wife's stirring. She's waking up. She's realizing what's going on. My kids are in the back. He's shining the light in, all this kind of stuff. So he walks back to the car, writes me an enormous ticket, brings it back up, hands it to me, on we go. I get home the next morning, I guess, I finally woke up, I read all the things, and as I read through the charges, all of which I was guilty for, it added up to like 650 bucks for all these things that I'd done wrong. Now we had just moved, I was a youth minister, my wife wasn't working, she just started grad school, we had two little kids, we just bought a house, we didn't have much money at all. And 650 bucks, I don't know what that sounds like to you, but for me in that moment, it was a ton of money, and I just felt the weight of my rebellion <laughs> telling on me. And at the bottom of the ticket, there was an order there to report to court. And so I was due up in Orr City to go to court and defend myself against these charges. And guys, I was completely guilty. But I dialed the number on there and I called the city hall in Orr City and luckily the big bellied sheriff didn't answer. It was this sweet little old lady. I mean, you could tell from her voice that she was somewhere between 800 and 1,000 years old. I mean, she was, <laughs> but she was so sweet. It's like, honey, what can I do for you? All this, just this, I mean, I, I'm sure your grandma is great, but like this was, this lady was the best. So I told her the situation. I told her what had happened. I told her the charges. I told her I was guilty of all of it. And I explained to her there was no, I mean, I lived five hours from there. I think I was going to be out of town on like a youth group trip or something. There was no way I was going to be able to report to court. And she told me to hold on just a second. She went off the phone. She came back a couple minutes later. And I'll never forget the words she said. She said, I'll take care of it. And I said, I don't understand what you mean. Do you mean that I don't have to come up to court? Like, can I just send a check? I mean, I'm guilty. I did, I did all these things wrong. What, what do you want me to do? And she said it again. She said, I'll take care of it. I was like, ma'am, I don't, I don't really understand what you mean. Like, I, I did all this. I'll figure out a way to pay the money. Just let me know where to send the money and I'll pay for it. I'm guilty. And she said it again. She said, I'll take care of it. And when she said those words that third time, that weight that I had felt, it just fell. 
I mean, it just melted. When she said, I'll take care of it, I knew that I didn't have to carry that with me anymore. Young people, here's what I want you to understand. So, so often, we find ourselves trapped. We find ourselves in chains with the burden of our sin and darkness and rebellion weighing us down. And we're guilty. We're busted. So we lie. And we act like everything's okay. If you do that, you will remain in your chains. We cover it up. We project a better image than how we really feel on, on the inside. Young people, if you do that, you will remain in your chains. You will remain bound by your own rebellion. We hide from people that know us, our youth ministers and our parents. The people that we know love us, we hide from them because we don't want them to see the ugly parts. We don't want them to see the chains. And if you continue to do that, you're going to continue to feel the weight of your rebellion on your shoulders again and again. The only way your chains will be broken is if you step into the light. Your rebellion is always going to be right there saying to you, I'm going to tell, I'm going to tell, I'm going to tell. And what I want for you tonight is for you to hear the sweet whisper of Jesus saying to you, I'll take care of it. And so that's the invitation tonight. We're going to have some adults get up and stand in the aisles. And here's what we're going to do. Just hang with me here. We're going to have an opportunity for some freedom. We're going to have an invitation to some repentance. We're, we're going to have this moment where you can quite literally step into the light and have someone intercede on your behalf that Jesus, your advocate, would come and make you free and forgive you of your sin and intercede on your behalf so that you can feel freedom and not continue to feel in bondage. So adults, if you would, would you, would you take your places on the aisles? And, and here's what we're going to do. We're going to throw some simple words up onto the screen, but these aren't just words. These are a declaration that we want to invite you to make at the ends of the rows with whoever you're nearest to. And as you read these words, students, as someone reads these words to you, I want to invite you, if you're willing, to feel the freedom that can come from stepping into the light and allowing Jesus to illuminate your life and just snap the chains that have been holding you down for so long. And after you feel that freedom, if you would just stand at your seat. And when you stand at your seat experiencing that freedom for yourself, if you would turn to the next person in your row, or if there's a couple empty seats scoot down to the next and declare these same words to them that Jesus, our advocate, wants to shine light into our life and relieve our burdens and help us to feel the freedom that can only come from him. And if we could see that move across the rows as we declare those words one to another, one by one, and as we remain standing as we break our chains and we stand and have the opportunity to worship together in this freedom that we have. But that's not all. It may be that as we sing and as we experience this together and as we feel this freedom together, that you need to grab someone to intercede for you. And so we'll have these lights set up where you can get to them. And it may be that as you experience this new feeling of freedom, the first thing you need to do is have somebody pray for you. And I would love for you to come to one of these places that'll be here on the sides and just have somebody pray for you as you literally step through the light, allowing Jesus to illuminate your life and advocate for you and empower you to live in that freedom. And it may be that as we have all week, you may need to repent, 
you may need to grab an adult leader and come to one of these lights. And as a way of declaring that you want Jesus to illuminate your life, to repent of your sin, to surrender to him, you flip on the light and we will celebrate together the freedom that we share, that we share in that freedom, not alone, but with people who will intercede for us, that will help us to the light, and that we can surrender to Jesus one by one, and then celebrate all together, that while our rebellion may tell on us, our advocate illuminates our life, and he's gonna take care of it. Let's worship, let's invite Jesus to light up our lives, and let's see chains of bondage broken down the rows, and let's celebrate the freedom that we have in Jesus.